who knew what had to change to bring about civil rights in America. He had many ideas about what needed to happen, but so did others. And not all of his ideas were good. He was not a perfect man, he had his complexities. But Dr. King was absolute in his conviction. He knew change had to happen in America. His clarity of why, his sense of purpose, gave him the strength and energy to continue his fight against often seemingly insurmountable odds. There were others like him who shared his vision of America, but many of them gave up after too many defeats. Defeat is painful. And the ability to continue head on, day after day, takes something more than knowing what legislation needs to be passed. For civil rights to truly take hold in the country, its organizers had to rally everyone. They may have been able to pass legislation, but they needed more than that, they needed to change a country. Only if they could rally a nation to join the cause, not because they had to, but because they wanted to, could any significant change endure. But no one person can effect lasting change alone. It would take others who believed what King believed. The details of how to achieve civil rights or what needed to be done were debatable, and different groups tried different strategies. Violence was employed by some, appeasement by others. Regardless of how or what was being done, there was one thing everyone had in common, why they were doing it. It was not just Martin Luther King's unflappable conviction that was able to stir a population, but his ability to put his why into words. Dr. King had a gift. He talked about what he believed. And his words had the power to inspire, I believe. I believe. I believe. There are two types of laws, he shared, those that are just and those that are unjust. A just law, Dr. King expounded, is a man-made code that squares with the moral law. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Any law that uplifts the human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. His belief was bigger than the civil rights movement. It was about all of mankind and how we treat each other. Of course, his why developed as a result of the time and place in which he was born and the color of his skin, but the civil rights movement served as the ideal platform for Dr. King to bring his why, his belief in equality, to life. People heard his beliefs and his words touched them deep inside. Those who believed what he believed took that cause and made it their own. And they told people what they believed. And those people told others what they believed. Some organized to get that belief out more efficiently. And in the summer of 1963, a quarter of a million people showed up to hear Drive. King deliver his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. But how many people showed up for Dr. King? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It was what they believed. It was what they saw as an opportunity to help America become a better version of itself. It was they who wanted to live in a country that reflected their own values and beliefs that inspired them to get on a bus to travel for eight hours to stand in the Washington sun in the middle of August to hear Dr. King speak. Being in Washington was simply one of the things they did to prove what they believed. Showing up that day was one of the what's to their own why. This was a cause and it was their cause. Dr. King's speech itself served as a visceral reminder of the belief shared by everyone who stood there listening. And that speech was about what he believed, not how they were going to do it. He gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. It was a statement of purpose and not a comprehensive 12-point plan to achieving civil rights in America. Dr. King offered America a place to go, not a plan to follow. The plan had its place, but not on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Dr. King's articulation of his belief was something powerful enough to rally those who shared that belief even if they weren't personally affected by the inequalities. Nearly a quarter of the people who came to the rally that day were white. This was a belief not about black America, this was a belief about a shared America. Dr. King was the leader of a cause. A cause for all those who believed what he believed regardless of skin color. 
It wasn't the details of his plans that earned him the right to lead. It was what he believed and his ability to communicate it clearly that people followed. In essence, he, like all great leaders, became the symbol of the belief. Dr. King came to personify the cause. To this day we build statues of him to keep that belief alive and tangible. People followed him not because of his idea of a changed America. People followed him because of their idea of a changed America. The part of the brain that influences our behavior and decisions does not have the capacity for language. We have trouble saying clearly, in emotional terms, why we do what we do, and offer rationalizations that, though valid and true, are not powerful enough to inspire others. So when asked why they showed up that day, people pointed to Dr. King and said simply, because I believe. More than anything else, what Martin Luther King Jr. gave us was clarity, a way to explain how we felt. He gave us the words that inspired us. He gave us something to believe in, something we could easily share with our friends. Everyone at the mall that day shared a set of values and beliefs. And everyone there that day, regardless of skin color or race or sex, trusted each other. It was that trust, that common bond, that shared belief that fueled a movement that would change a nation. We believed. We believed. We believed. Part 4, How to Rally Those Who Believe But Know How Energy Excites. Charisma Inspires. Ra. With the raw, Steve Ballmer, the man who replaced Bill Gates as CEO of Microsoft, bursts onto the stage of the company's annual global summit meeting. Ballmer loves Microsoft, he says so in no uncertain words. He also knows how to pump up a crowd. His energy is almost folkloric. He pumps his fists and runs from one end of the stage to the other, he screams and he sweats. He is remarkable to watch and the crowd loves it. As Ballmer proves, without a doubt, energy can motivate a crowd. But can it inspire a population? What happens the next day or the next week when Ballmer's energy is not there to motivate his employees? Is energy enough to keep a company of about 80,000 people focused? In contrast, Bill Gates is shy and awkward, a social misfit. He does not fit the stereotype of the leader of a multi-billion dollar corporation. He is not the most energetic public speaker. When Bill Gates speaks, however, people listen with bated breath. They hang on his every word. When Gates speaks, he doesn't rally a room, he inspires it. Those who hear him take what he says and carry his words with them for weeks, months or years. Gates doesn't have energy, but Bill Gates inspires. Energy motivates but charisma inspires. Energy is easy to see, easy to measure and easy to copy. Charisma is hard to define, nearly impossible to measure and too elusive to copy. All great leaders have charisma because all great leaders have clarity of why, and an undying belief in a purpose or cause bigger than themselves. It's not Bill Gates' passion for computers that inspires us, it's his undying optimism that even the most complicated problems can be solved. He believes we can find ways to remove obstacles to ensure that everyone can live and work to their greatest potential. It is his five optimism to which we are drawn. Living through the computer revolution, he saw the computer as a perfect technology to help us all become more productive and achieve our greatest potential. That belief inspired his vision of a PC on every desk to come to life. Ironic considering Microsoft never even made PCs. It wasn't just what computers did that, Gates saw the impact for the new technology, it was why we needed them. Today, the work he does with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has nothing to do with software, but it is another way he has found to bring his why to life. He is looking for ways to solve problems. He still has an undying belief. And he still, believes that if we can help people, this time those with less privilege, remove some seemingly simple obstacles, then they too will have an opportunity to be more productive and lift themselves up to achieve their great status but why, but know-how potential. For Gates, all that has changed is what he is doing to bring his cause to life. Charisma has nothing to do with energy, it comes from a clarity of why. 
It comes from absolute conviction in an ideal bigger than oneself. Energy, in contrast, comes from a good night's sleep or lots of caffeine. Energy can excite. But only charisma can inspire. Charisma commands loyalty. Energy does not. Energy can always be injected into an organization to motivate people to do things. Bonuses, promotions, other carrots and even a few sticks can get people to work harder, for sure, but the gains are, like all manipulations, short term. Over time, such tactics cost more money and increase stress for employee and employer alike, and eventually will become the main reason people show up for work every day. That's not loyalty. That's the employee version of repeat business. Loyalty among employees is when they turn down more money or benefits to continue working at the same company. Loyalty to a company trumps pay and benefits. And unless you're an astronaut, it's not the work we do that inspires us either. It's the cause we come to work for. We don't want to come to work to build a wall, we want to come to work to build a cathedral. The chosen path raised in Ohio, 60 miles from Dayton, Neil Armstrong grew up on a healthy diet of stories about the Wright brothers. From a very early age he dreamed of flying. He'd make model airplanes, read magazines about flying and stare at the heavens through a telescope mounted on the roof of his house. He even got his pilot's license before he got his driver's license. With a childhood passion that became reality, Armstrong was destined to become an astronaut. For the rest of us, however, our careers paths are more like Jeff Sumter's. While Sumter was in high school, his mother arranged for him to get a summer internship at the bank where she worked. Four years after he finished high school he called the bank to see if he could do some part-time work, and they eventually offered him a full-time job. Whammo, Jeff's got a career as a banker. In fact, after 15 years in the industry he and a colleague by the name of Thray Morst went on to start their own bank, Lewis and Clark Bank in Portland, Oregon. Sumter is very good at what he does, he's been one of the top performing loan officers throughout his career. He's well liked and well respected among his colleagues and clients. But even Jeff will admit that he doesn't have much of a passion for banking, per se. Though he's not living out his childhood dream, he is passionate for something. It's not what he does that gets him out of bed every morning. It's why he does it. Our career paths are largely incidental. I never planned to be doing what I'm doing now. As a kid I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, but in college I set my sights on becoming a criminal prosecutor. While I was in law school, however, I became disillusioned with the idea of being a lawyer. It just didn't feel right. I was at law school in England, where the law is one of the last truly English professions, not wearing a pinstriped suit to an interview could hurt my chances of getting a job. This was not my cup of tea. I happened to be dating a young woman who was studying marketing at Syracuse University. She could see what inspired me and what frustrated me about the law and suggested I try my hand in the field. And whammo, I'd gotten myself a new career in marketing. But that's just one of the things I've done, it's not my passion and it's not how I define my life. My cause, to inspire people to do the things that inspire them, is why I get out of bed every day. The excitement is trying to find new ways, different what's to bring my cause to life, of which this book is one. But know how regardless of what we do in our lives, our why, our driving purpose, cause or belief, never changes. If our golden circle is in balance, what we do is simply the tangible way we find to breathe life into that cause. Developing software was merely one of the things Bill Gates did to bring his cause to life. An airline gave Herb Kelleher the perfect outlet to spread his belief in freedom. Putting a man on the moon was one goal John F. Kennedy used to rally people to bring to life his belief that service to the nation, and not being serviced by the nation, would lead America to advance and prosper. Apple gave Steve Jobs a way to challenge the status quo and do something big in the world. All the things these charismatic leaders did were the tangible ways they found to bring their wise to life. But none of them could have imagined what they would be doing when they were young. 
when a why is clear, those who share that belief will be drawn to it and maybe want to take part in bringing it to life. If that belief is amplified it can have the power to rally even more believers to raise their hands and declare, I want to help. With a group of believers all rallying around a common purpose, cause or belief, amazing things can happen. But it takes more than inspiration to do become great. Inspiration only starts the process, you need something more to drive a movement. Amplify the source of inspiration The golden circle is not just a communication tool, it also provides some insight into how great organizations are organized. As we start to add dimension to the concept of the golden circle, it is no longer helpful to look at it as a purely two-dimensional model. If it is to provide any real value in how to build a great organization in our very three-dimensional world, the golden circle needs to be three-dimensional. The good news is, it is. It is, in fact, a top-down view of a cone. Turn it on its side and you can see its full value. The cone represents a company or an organization, an inherently hierarchical and organized system. Sitting at the top of the system, representing the why, is a leader, in the case of a company, that's usually the CEO, or at least we hope it is. The next level down, the how level, typically includes the senior executives who are inspired by the leader's vision and know how to bring it to life. Don't forget that a why is just a belief, hows are the actions we take to realize that belief and what's are the results of those actions. No matter how charismatic or inspiring the leader is, if there are not people in the organization inspired to bring that vision to reality, to build an infrastructure with systems and processes, then at best, inefficiency reigns, and at worst, failure results. In this rendering the how level represents a person or a small group responsible for building the infrastructure that can make AY tangible. That may happen in marketing, operations, finance, human resources and all the other C-suite departments. Beneath that, at the what level, is where the rubber meets the road. It is at this level that the majority of the employees sit and where all the tangible stuff actually happens. I have a dream, and he's got the plan, drive. King said he had a dream, and he inspired people to make his dream their own. What Ralph Abernathy lent the movement, but know-how was something else, he knew what it would take to realize that dream, and he showed people how to do it. He gave the dream structure. Dr. King spoke about the philosophical implications of the movement, while Abernathy, Dr. King's one-time mentor, long-time friend and financial secretary and treasurer of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, would help people understand the specific steps they needed to take. Now, Abernathy would tell the audience following a rousing address by Dr. King, let me tell you what that means for tomorrow morning. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the leader, but he didn't change America alone. Though Dr. King inspired the movement, to actually move people requires organizing. As is the case with almost all great leaders, there were others around Dr. King who knew better how to do that. For every great leader, for every Y type, there is an inspired how type or group of how types who take the intangible cause and build the infrastructure that can give it life. That infrastructure is what actually makes any measurable change or success possible. The leader sits at the top of the cone, at the start, the point of why, while the how types sit below and are responsible for actually making things happen. The leader imagines the destination and the how types find the route to get there. A destination without a route leads to meandering and inefficiency, something a great many why types will experience without the help of others to ground them. A route without a destination, however, may be efficient, but to what end? It's all fine and good to know how to drive, but it's more fulfilling when you have a place to go. For Dr. King, Ralph Abernathy was one of those he inspired and who knew how to make the cause actionable and tangible. Dr. King's job was to interpret the ideology and theology of nonviolence, said Abernathy. My job was more simple and down to earth. I would tell, people, don't ride those buses. 
In every case of a great charismatic leader who ever achieved anything of significance, there was always a person or small group lurking in the shadows who knew how to take the vision and make it a reality. Dr. King had a dream. But no matter how inspiring a dream may be, a dream that cannot come to life stays a dream. Dr. King dreamed of many of the same things as countless other African Americans who grew up in the pre-civil rights South. He spoke of many of the same themes. He felt the same outrage perpetrated by an unjust system. But it was King's unflappable optimism and his words that inspired a population. Dr. King didn't change America by himself. He wasn't a legislator, for example, but legislation was created to give all people in the United States equal rights regardless of skin color. It wasn't Dr. King who changed America, it was the movement of millions of others whom he inspired that changed the course of history. But how do you organize millions of people? Forget millions, how do you organize hundreds or tens of people? The vision and charisma of the leader are enough to attract the innovators and the early adopters. Trusting their guts and their intuition, these people will make the greatest sacrifices to help see the vision become a reality. With each success, with every tangible demonstration that the vision can in fact become reality, the more practical-minded majority starts to take interest. What was previously just a dream soon becomes a provable and tangible reality. And when that happens, a tipping point can be reached and then things really get moving. Those who know why need those who know how the pessimists are usually right, to paraphrase Thomas Friedman, author of The World is Flat, but it's the optimists who change the world. Bill Gates imagined a world in which the computer could help us all reach our greatest potential. And it happened. Now he imagines a world in which malaria does not exist. And it will happen. The Wright brothers imagined a world in which we'd all take to the skies as easily as we catch the buzz. And it happened. Why types have the power to change the course of industries or even the world? If only they knew how. Why types are the visionaries, the ones with the overactive imaginations. They tend to be optimists who believe that all the things they imagine can actually be accomplished. How types live more in the here and now. They are the realists and have a clearer sense of all things practical. Why types are focused on the things most people can't see, like the future. How types are focused on things most people can see and tend to be better at building structures and processes and getting things done. One is not better than the other, they are just different ways people naturally see and experience the world. Gates is a Y type. So were the Wright brothers and Steve Jobs, and Herb Kelleher. But they didn't do it alone. They couldn't. They needed those who knew how. If it hadn't been for my big brother, I'd have been in jail several times for checks bouncing, said Walt Disney, only half joking, to a Los Angeles audience in 1957. I never knew what was in the bank. He kept me on the straight and narrow. Walt Disney was a white type, a dreamer whose dream came true thanks to the help of his more sensible older brother Roy, a how type. Walt Disney began his career creating cartoon drawings for advertisements, but moved quickly to making animated movies. It was 1923 and Hollywood was emerging as the heart of the movie business, and Walt wanted to be part of it. Roy, who was eight years older, had been working at a bank. Roy was always in awe of his brother's talent and imagination, but he also knew that Walt was prone to taking risks and to neglecting business affairs. Like all Y guys, Walt was busy thinking about what the future looked like and often forget he was living in the present. Walt Disney dreamed, drew and imagined, Roy stayed in the shadow, forming an empire, wrote Bob Thomas, a Disney biographer. A brilliant financier and businessman, Roy helped turn Walt Disney's dreams into reality, building the company that bears his brother's name. It was Roy who founded the Buena Vista Distribution Company that made Disney films a central part of American childhood. It was Roy who created the merchandising business that transformed Disney characters into household names. And, like almost every how-type, 
Roy never wanted to be the front man, he preferred to stay in the background and focus on how to build his brother's vision. Most people in the world are how types. Most people are quite functional in the real world and can do their jobs and do very well. Some may be very successful and even make millions of dollars, but they will never build billion dollar businesses or change the world. How types don't need why types to do well. But why guys, for all their vision and imagination, often get the short end of the stick. Without someone inspired by their vision and the knowledge to make it a reality, most Y types end up as starving visionaries, people with all the answers but never accomplishing much themselves. Although so many of them fancy themselves visionaries, in reality most successful entrepreneurs are how types. Ask an entrepreneur what they love about being an entrepreneur and most will tell you they love to build things. That they talk about building is a sure clue that they know how to get things done. A business is a structure, systems and processes that need to be assembled. It is the how types who are more adept at building those processes and systems. But most companies, no matter how well built, do not become billion dollar businesses or change the course of industries. To reach the billion dollar status, to alter the course of an industry, requires a very special and rare partnership between one who knows why and those who know how. In nearly every case of a person or an organization that has gone on to inspire people and do great things, there exists this special partnership between why and how. Bill Gates, for example, may have been the visionary who imagined a world with a PC on every desk, but Paul Allen built the company. Herb Kelleher was able to personify and preach the cause of freedom, but it was Rollin King who came up with the idea for Southwest Airlines. Steve Jobs is the rebel's evangelist, but Steve Wozniak is the engineer who made the Apple work. Jobs had the vision, Woz had the goods. It is the partnership of a vision of the future and the talent to get it done that makes an organization great. This relationship starts to clarify the difference between a vision statement and a mission statement in an organization. The vision is the public statement of the founder's intent, why the company exists. It is literally the vision of a future that does not yet exist. The mission statement is a description of the route, the guiding principles, how the company intends to create that future. When both of those things are stated clearly, the why type and the how type are both certain about their roles in the partnership. Both are working together with clarity of purpose and a plan to get there. For it to work, however, it requires more than a set of skills, it requires trust. As discussed at length in part 3, trusting relationships are invaluable for us to feel safe. Our ability to trust people or organizations allows us to take risks and feel supported in our efforts. And perhaps the most trusting relationship that exists is between the visionary and the builder, the why guy and the how guy. In organizations able to inspire, the best chief executives are why types people who wake up every day to lead a cause and not just run a company. In these organizations, the best chief financial officers and chief operating officers are high-performing how types, those with the strength of ego to admit they are not visionaries themselves but are inspired by the leader's vision and know how to build the structure that can bring it to life. The best how types generally do not want to be out front preaching the vision, they prefer to work behind the scenes to build the systems that can make the vision a reality. It takes the combined skill and effort of both for great things to happen. It's not an accident that these unions of why and how so often come from families or old friendships. A shared upbringing and life experience increases the probability of a shared set of values and beliefs. In the case of family or childhood friends, upbringing and common experiences are nearly exactly the same. That's not to say you can't find a good partner somewhere else. It's just that growing up with somebody and having a common life experience increases the likelihood of a shared common worldview. Walt Disney and Roy Disney were brothers. Bill Gates and Paul Allen went to high school together in Seattle. Herb Kelleher was Rollin King's divorce attorney and old friend. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy both preached in Birmingham, long before the civil rights movement took form. And Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were best friends in high school. 
The list goes on. To run or to lead for all the talented how types running today's organizations, they can achieve success that will last their lifetimes, but they will spend their lifetimes running their companies. There are many ways to be successful and drive profits. Any number of manipulations, only some of which I have touched upon in this book, work quite well. Even the ability to create a tipping point is possible without creating lasting change. It's called a fad. But great organizations function exactly like any social movement. They inspire people to talk about a product or idea, include that product in the context of their lifestyle, share the idea or even find ways to advance the prosperity of the organization itself. Great organizations not only excite the human spirit, they inspire people to take part in helping to advance the cause without needing to pay them or incentivize them in any particular way. No cashback incentives or mail-in rebates required. People feel compelled to spread the word, not because they have to, but because they want to. They willingly take up arms to share the message that inspires them. Build a megaphone that works after a three-month selection process, BCI finally chose a new ad agency to help develop a campaign to launch their new product line. Big Company Incorporated is a well-known brand operating in a fairly cluttered market space. As a manufacturer, their products are sold via a third-party sales force, often on the shelves of big box retailers, so they don't have direct control over the sales process. The best they can do is to try to influence the sale from a distance, with marketing. BCI is a good company with a strong culture. The employees respect the management, and in general the company does good work. But over the years the competition has grown fairly stiff. And although BCI has a good product and competitive pricing, it is still tough to maintain strong growth year over year. This year, BCI management is particularly excited because the company is launching a new product they really think will make BCI stand out. To help promote it, BCI's agency has launched a major new ad campaign. From the leading maker, says the new ad, comes the newest, most innovative product you've ever seen. The ad goes on to talk about all the new features and benefits, and includes something about the quality you've come to expect from BCI, something the BCI executives felt quite strongly about including. BCI executives have worked hard to build their company's reputation and they want to leverage it. They are very excited about their new campaign 159. Start with why and are really banking on the success of this product to help drive sales in general. They know they do good work, and they want to get the message out. They need it to be loud. And with a budget of millions of dollars to advertise their new product, in that respect. BCI succeeds. But there is a problem. BCI and their agency did a good job of telling people about their new product. The work was quite creative. They were able to explain what was new and special about their latest innovation, and focus groups agreed that the new product was much better than that of the competition. The millions of dollars in media ensured that lots of people would see their advertising and see it often. Their reach and frequency, the measurement commonly used by ad agencies to gauge the number of people exposed to the advertising was very good. There is no doubt that their message was loud. The problem was, it wasn't clear. It was all what's and how and no why. Even though people learned what the product did, no one knew what BCI believed. The good news is, it's not a complete loss, the products will sell as long as the ads are on the air and the promotions remain competitive. It's an effective strategy, but an expensive way to make money. What if Martin Luther King had delivered a comprehensive 12-point plan about achieving civil rights in America, a plan more comprehensive than any other plan for civil rights ever offered? Booming through the speakers that summer's day in 1963, his message would have been loud. Microphones, like advertising and PR, are fantastic for making sure a message is heard. Like BCI, King's message would still have reached thousands of people. But his belief would not have been clear. Volume is reasonably easy to achieve. All it takes is money or stunts. Money can pay to keep a message front and center. 
and publicity stunts are good at getting on the news. But neither plants seeds of loyalty. Many reading this may remember that Oprah Winfrey once gave away a free car to every member of her studio audience. It happened several years ago, in 2004, and still people refer to the stunt. But how many can recall the model of car she gave away? That's the problem. It was Pontiac that donated $7 million worth of cars, 276 of their new G6 model, to be exact. And it was Pontiac that saw the stunt as a way to market their new car. Yet although the stunt worked well to reinforce Oprah's generous nature, something with which we are all familiar, few remember that Pontiac was a part of the event. Worse, the stunt didn't do anything to reinforce some purpose, cause or belief that Pontiac represents. We had no idea what Pontiac's why was before the stunt, so it's hard for the publicity stunt to do much more than, well, be a stunt to get some publicity. With no sense of why, there is nothing else it's doing. For a message to have real impact, to affect behavior and seed loyalty, it needs more than publicity. It needs to publicize some higher purpose, cause or belief to which those with similar values and beliefs can relate. Only then can the message create any lasting mass market success. For a stunt to appeal to the left side of the curve of the law of diffusion, why the stunt is being performed, beyond the desire to generate press, must be clear. Though there may be short-term benefits without clarity, loud is nothing more than excessive volume or in business vernacular, clutter. And companies wonder why differentiation is such a challenge these days. Have you heard the volume coming from some of them? Question mark one in contrast, what would have been the impact of Dr. King's speech had he not had a microphone and loudspeakers? His vision would have been no less clear. His words would have been no less inspiring. He knew what he believed and he spoke with passion and charisma about that belief. But only the few people with front row seats would have been inspired by those words. A leader with a cause, whether it be an individual or an organization, must have a megaphone through which to deliver his message. And it must be clear and loud to work. Clarity of purpose, cause or belief is important, but it is equally important that people hear you. For AY to have the power to move people it must not only be clear. It must be amplified to reach enough people to tip the scale. It's no coincidence that the three-dimensional golden circle is a cone. It is, in practice, a megaphone. An organization effectively becomes the vessel through which a person with a clear purpose, cause or belief can speak to the outside world. But for a megaphone to work, clarity must come first. Without a clear message, what will you amplify? Say it only if you believe it Dr. King used his megaphone to rally throngs of people to follow him in pursuit of social justice. The Wright brothers used their megaphone to rally their local community to help them build the technology that could change the world. Thousands of people heard John F. Kennedy's belief in service and rallied to put a man on the moon in less than a decade. The ability to excite and inspire people to go out of their way to contribute to something bigger than themselves is not unique to social causes. Any organization is capable of building a megaphone that can achieve a huge impact. In fact, it is one of the defining factors that makes an organization great. Great organizations don't just drive profits, they lead people, and they change the course of industries and sometimes our lives in the process. A clear sense of why sets expectations. When we don't know an organization's why, we don't know what to expect, so we expect the minimum, price, quality, service, features, the commodity stuff. But when we do have a sense for the why, we expect more. For those not comfortable being held to a higher standard, I strongly advise against trying to learn your why or keeping your golden circle in balance. Higher standards are hard to maintain. It requires the discipline to constantly talk about and remind everyone why the organization exists in the first place. It requires that everyone in the organization be held accountable to how you do things, to your values and guiding principles. And it takes time and effort to ensure that everything you say and do is consistent with your why.
But for those willing to put in the effort, there are some great advantages. Richard Branson first built Virgin Records into a multi-billion dollar retail music brand. Then he started a successful record label. Later he started an airline that is today considered one of the premier airlines in the world. He then started a soda brand, wedding planning company, insurance company and mobile phone service. And the list goes on. Likewise, Apple sells us computers, mobile phones, DVRs and MP3 players, and has replicated their capacity for innovation again and again. The ability of some companies not to just succeed but to repeat their successes due to the loyal followings they command, the throngs of people who root for their success. In the business world, they say Apple is a lifestyle brand. They underestimate Apple's power. Gucci is a lifestyle brand, Apple changes the course of industries. By any definition these few companies don't function like corporate entities. They exist as social movements. Repeating greatness Ron Brudu is not a household name, but he is a great leader. In 1985, he stood at a crosswalk with his two daughters waiting for the light to change so they could cross the street. A perfect opportunity, he thought, to teach the young girls a valuable life lesson. He pointed across the street to the red glow of the do not walk signal and asked them what they thought that sign meant. It means we have to stand here, they replied. Are you sure? he asked rhetorically. How do you know it's not telling us to run? Soft spoken and almost always wearing a well tailored three piece suit when he comes to work, Bruder looks like you would imagine a conservative executive to look like. But don't assume you know how things work simply based on what you see. Bruder is anything but a stereotype. Though he has enjoyed the trappings of success, he is not motivated by them. They have always been the unintended byproduct of his work. Bruder is driven by a clear sense of why. He sees a world in which people accept the lives they live and do the things they do not because they have to, but because no one ever showed them an alternative. This is the lesson he was teaching his daughters that day at the crosswalk, there is always another perspective to be considered. That Bruder always starts with why has enabled him to achieve great things for himself. But more significantly, it is his ability to share his why through the things he does that inspires those around him to do great things for themselves. Like most of us, the career path Bruder has followed is incidental. But why he does things has never changed. Everything Bruder has ever done starts with his why, his unyielding belief that if you can simply show someone that an alternative route is possible, it can open the possibility that such a route can be followed. Though the work he is doing today is world-altering, Bruder hasn't always been in the world peace business. Like many inspiring leaders, he has changed the course of an industry. But Ron Bruder is no one-hit wonder. He has been able to repeat his success and change the course of multiple industries, multiple times. A senior executive at a large food conglomerate that sold vegetables, canned goods and meats decided to buy a travel agency for his nephew. He asked Bruder, as the chief financial officer of the company at the time, to take a look at the financials of the agency before he went through with the purchase. Seeing an opportunity others didn't, Bruder decided to join the small travel agency to help lead it. Once there, he saw how all the other travel agencies worked and took an alternative course. Greenwell became the first travel agency on the eastern seaboard to take advantage of new technologies and fully computerize their operations. Not only did they become one of the most successful companies in the region, but after only a year, their business model became a standard for the whole industry. Then Bruder did it again. A former client of Bruder's, Sam Rosengarten, was in some dirty businesses, coal, oil and gas, all industries that created brownfields, land that had been contaminated by their operations. Little could be done with brownfields. They were too polluted to develop, and the liability to clean them up was so high that the insurance premiums alone made it too prohibitive to even try. But Bruder doesn't see challenges the same way as everyone else. Most avoided brownfields because they could only see the cost to clean them up. Bruder focused instead on the actual cleaning. 
His alternative perspective revealed the perfect solution. Bruder had already formed his real estate development company, Brookhill, and with 18 employees, he was doing quite well. Knowing what he needed to do to seize the opportunity, he approached Dames and Moore, one of the largest environmental engineering companies in the world, and shared his new perspective with them. They loved his idea and formed a partnership to pursue it. With an engineering company with 18,000 people on board, the perceived risk was greatly minimized and the insurance companies were happy to offer affordable insurance. With affordable insurance in place, Credit Suisse First Boston offered financing that gave Brookhill the ability to buy, remediate, redevelop and sell almost $200 million worth of former environmentally contaminated properties. Brookhill, so-called 165. Start with why because Bruder comes from Brooklyn and, as he puts it, it's a long, uphill climb to get out of Brooklyn, was the pioneer of the brownfield redevelopment industry. An industry that thrives to this day. Bruder's why not only steered a path that was good for business, but in the process also helped clean up the environment. It doesn't matter what Ron Bruder does. The industries and the challenges are incidental. What never changes is why he does things. Bruder knows that, no matter how good an opportunity looks on paper, no matter how smart he is and no matter his track record, he would never be able to achieve anything unless there were others to help him. He knows that success is a team sport he has a remarkable ability to attract those who believe what he believes. Talented people are drawn to him with one request, how can I help? Having defied accepted perspectives and revolutionized more than one industry, Bruder has now set his sights on a bigger challenge, world peace. He founded the Education for Employment Foundation, the megaphone that would help him do it. The F Foundation is making significant headway in helping young men and women in the Middle East to significantly alter the course of their lives and indeed the course of the region of their lives just as he taught his daughters at the crosswalk that there is always an alternative route he brings an alternative perspective to the problems in middle east like of all bruder's past successes the f foundation will drive businesses and do tremendous amounts of good in the process bruder doesn't run companies he leads movements all movements are personal it started on september 11 2001 like so many of us Bruder turned his attention to the Middle East after the attacks to ask why something like that could happen. He understood that if such an event could happen once, it could happen again, and for the lives of his own daughters he wanted to find a way to prevent that. 166. Status but why, but know how in the course of trying to figure out what he could do, he made a remarkable discovery that went much deeper than protecting his daughters or even the prevention of terrorism in the United States. In America, he realized, the vast majority of young people wake up in the morning with a feeling that there is opportunity for them in the future. Regardless of the economy, most young boys and girls who grow up in the United States have an inherent sense of optimism that they can achieve something if they want to, to live the American dream. A young boy growing up in Gaza or a young girl living in Yemen does not wake up every day with the same feeling. Even if they have the desire, the same optimism is not there. It is too easy to point and say that the culture is different. That is not actionable. The real reason is that there is a distinct lack of institutions to give young people in the region a sense of optimism for their future. A college education in Jordan, for example, may offer some social status, but it doesn't necessarily prepare a young adult for what lies ahead. The education system, in cases like this, perpetuates a systemic cultural pessimism. Bruder realized the problems we face with terrorism in the West have less to do with what young boys and girls in the Middle East think about America and more to do with what they think about themselves and their own vision of the future. Through the F Foundation, Bruder is setting up programs across the Middle East to teach young adults the hard and soft skills that will help them feel like they have opportunity in life. To feel like they can be in control of their own destinies. Bruder is using the F Foundation to share his why on a global scale, to teach people that there is always an alternative to the path they think they are on. 
The Education for Employment Foundation is not an American charity hoping to do good in faraway lands. It is a global movement. Each F operation runs independently, with locals making up the majority of their local boards. Local leaders take personal responsibility to give young men and women that feeling of opportunity by giving them the skills, knowledge and, most importantly, the confidence to choose an alternative path for themselves. Mayado Abu Jabba is leading the movement in Jordan. Muhammad Najah is spreading the cause in Gaza and the West Bank. And May Inalur Yani is proving that a cause can even change a culture in Yemen. In Yemen, children can expect to receive nine years of education, this is one of the lowest rates in the world. In the United States, children can expect 16 years. Inspired by Bruder, Aloyani sees such an amazing opportunity for young men and women to change their perspective and take greater control of their own future. He set out to find capital to jumpstart his F operation in Sana, Yemen's capital, and in one week was able to raise $50,000. The speed at which he raised that amount is pretty good even by our philanthropic standards. But this is Yemen, and Yemen has no culture of philanthropy, making his achievement that much more remarkable. Yemen is also one of the poorest nations in the region. But when you tell people why you're doing what you're doing, remarkable things happen. Across the region, everyone involved in F believes that they can help teach their brothers and sisters and sons and daughters the skills that will help them change path that they think they are on. They are working to help the youth across the region believe that their future is bright and full of opportunity. And they don't do it for Bruder, they do it for themselves. That's the reason F will change the world. Sitting at the top of the megaphone, at the point of why, Bruder's role is to inspire, to start the movement. But it is those who believe who will effect the real change and keep the movement going. Anyone, regardless where they live, what they do or their nationality, can participate in this movement. It's about feeling like we belong. If you believe that there is an alternative path to the one, but know how we're on, and all we have to do is point to it, then visit the website ffoundation.org and join the movement. To change the world takes the support of all those who believe. Know how, then what? They marched in, single file. Not a word was spoken. No one made any eye contact with anyone else. They all looked the same. Their heads shaved, their clothes grey and tattered. Their boots dusty. One by one, they filled a large, cavernous room, like a hangar from a science fiction movie. The only color was grey. The walls were grey dust and smoke filled the space making even the air look grey. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of these drone people sat on neatly organized benches. Row after row after row. A sea of grey conformity. They all watched a projection of a huge talking head on the screen in the front of the room that filled the entire wall. This apparent leader recited dogma and propaganda, stating proudly that they were in complete control. They had achieved perfection, they were free of pests. Or so they thought. Running down one of the tunnels that led into the cavernous hangar, a lone blonde woman. She wore bright red shorts and a crisp white t-shirt. Like a lighthouse, her complexion and the color of her clothes seemed to shine through gray air. Pursued by security, she railed with a sledgehammer. This would not end well for the status quo. On January 22, 1984, Apple launched their Macintosh computer with their now famous commercial depicting an Orwellian scene of a totalitarian regime holding control over a population and promised that 1984 won't be like 1984 but this advertising was much more than just advertising. It was not about the features and benefits of a new product. It was not about a differentiating value proposition. It was, for all intents and purposes, a manifesto. A poetic ode to Apple's why, it was the film version of an individual rebelling against the status quo, igniting a revolution. And though their products have changed and fashions have changed, this commercial is as relevant today as it was 25 years ago when it first aired. And that's because a why never changes.
What you do can change with the times, but why you do it never does. The commercial is one of the many things the company has done or said over the years to show or tell the outside world what they believe. All Apple's advertising and communications, their products, partnerships, their packaging, their store design, they are all what's to Apple's why, proof that they actively challenge status quo thinking to empower the individual. Ever notice that their advertising never shows groups enjoying their products? Always individuals. Their Think Different campaign depicted individuals who thought differently, never groups. Always individuals. And when Apple tells us to think different, they are not just describing themselves. The ads showed pictures of Pablo Picasso, Martha Graham, Jim Henson, Alfred Hitchcock, to name a few, with the line Think Different on the upper right hand side of the page. Apple does not embody the rebel spirit because they associated themselves with known rebels. They chose known rebels because they embody the same rebel spirit. The why came before the creative solution in the advertising. Not a single ad showed a group. This is no accident. Empowering the individual spirit is why Apple exists. Apple knows their why and so do we. Agree with them or not, we know what they believe because they tell us. Speak clearly and ye shall be clearly understood an organization is represented by the cone in the three-dimensional view of the golden circle. This organized system sits atop another system, the marketplace. The marketplace is made up of all the customers and potential customers, all the press, the shareholders, all the competition, suppliers and all the money. This system is inherently chaotic and disorganized. The only contact that the organized system has with the disorganized system is at the base, at the what level. Everything an organization says and does communicates the leader's vision to the outside world. All the products and services that the company sells, all the marketing and advertising, all the contact with the world outside communicate this. If people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and if all the things happening at the what level do not clearly represent why the company exists, then the ability to inspire is severely complicated. When a company is small, this is not an issue because the founder has plenty of direct contact with the outside world. Trusted how types may be in short supply and the founder opts to make a majority of the big decisions. The founder or leader actually goes out and talks to customers, sells the product and hires most if not all the employees. As the company grows, however, systems and processes are added and other people will join. The cause embodied by an individual slowly morphs into a structured organization and the cone starts to take shape. As it grows, the leader's role changes. He will no longer be the loudest part of the megaphone, he will become the source of the message that is to flow through the megaphone. When a company is small, it revolves around the personality of the founder. There is no debate that the founder's personality is the personality of the company. Why then do we think things change just because a company is successful? What's the difference between Steve Jobs the man and Apple the company? Nothing. What's the difference between Sir Richard Branson's personality and Virgin's personality? Nothing. As a company grows, the CEO's job is to personify the why. To ooze of it. To talk about it. To preach it. To be a symbol of what the company believes. They are the intention and what the company says and does is their voice. Like Martin Luther King and his social movement, the leader's job is no longer to close all the deals, it is to inspire, close all. As the organization grows, the leader becomes physically removed, farther and farther away from what the company does, and even farther away from the outside market. I love asking course what their biggest priority is, and, depending on their size or structure, I generally get one of two answers, customers or shareholders. Sadly, there aren't many course of companies of any reasonable size who have daily contact with customers anymore. And customers and shareholders alike both exist outside the organization in the chaotic world of the marketplace. Just as the cone demonstrates, the CEO's job, the leader's responsibility, is not to focus on the outside market, it's to focus on the layer directly beneath, 
How? The leader must ensure that there are people on the team who believe what they believe and know how to build it. The how types are responsible for understanding why and must come to work every day to develop the systems and hire the people who are ultimately responsible for bringing the why to life. The general employees are responsible for demonstrating the why to the outside world in whatever the company says and does. The challenge is that they are able to do it clearly. Remember the biology of the golden circle. The why exists in the part of the brain that controls feelings and decision making but not language. What's exist in the part of the brain that controls rational thought and language? Comparing the biology of the brain to the three-dimensional rendering of the golden circle reveals a profound insight. The leader sitting at the top of the organization is the inspiration, the symbol of the reason we do what we do. They represent the emotional limbic brain. What the company says and does represents the rational thought and language of the neocortex. Just as it is hard for people to speak their feelings, like someone trying to explain why they love their spouse, it is equally hard for an organization to explain its why. The part of the brain that controls feelings and the part that controls language are not the same. Given that the cone is simply a three-dimensional rendering of the golden circle, which is firmly grounded in the biology of human decision-making, 